Morning nears. Soon the sun will rise. Time for me to move on before the heat sets in. Try to find whatever it is I'm supposed to find. I set off before dawn to head back north. Hold on. In the dim light, I see... I see other people. Millions of people are gathered around, stretched as far as I can see in every direction, camped here at Mara. It looks much as it looked when I first arrived and saw the people of Israel, but there are no tents, no animals, no cooking fires. These people are unprepared sojourners like myself, most of them sleeping right now. A few stir. Now, here is a mystery. Did they come here in the night? How is it that I never noticed? Were they here all along? Was I not as alone as I had imagined? Or am I imagining them all now? Has the desert heat gotten to me? Even more strange, as the light increases, I begin to recognize some of these faces. People from my church are near me. Believers I know from other churches. Several pastors. This is so strange, but it feels perfectly normal. Is this a dream? Some sort of a vision? I walk among them. Strangers. Friends. Acquaintances. Brothers and sisters. All. And by the time I reach the edge of the camp and head off on my own, I begin to understand I am not the only one to take this journey. Nearly every believer goes through this same desert and must visit this same place. As I reach the outskirts, I'm joined by another pilgrim. An older man is going this way, too. We fall into step together, introduce ourselves, and begin to converse. Actually, it's more of an interview. I have so many questions, and he seems to have been this way before. Oh, yes, many times before. Sometimes alone, sometimes in a group. But I suppose I've been to Mara a dozen times at least. Why do you keep coming here? It's not exactly a vacation spot. <laughs> I come for the same reason that you come, and all the others come. God sends me there. Where are you going now? North, like you, for now. Beyond that, I will find out when I get there. Well, tell me, does this desert ever end? Will I ever get back to civilization again? You mean your old comfortable lifestyle? <laughs> Son, you are not in charge of such decisions. I can tell you that in my journey, I have been in want and I have had plenty, but I have learned the secret to contentment so that it doesn't matter so much where I am as who I am with. Okay, I have to ask, what is the secret to contentment? In a word, submit. Well, that's worth reflecting on, but let me ask, all these people, did I imagine them, or are they real? For that matter, am I imagining you right now? He laughs a bit. I must admit that he seems to have a peace about him, a wholehearted enjoyment of life, even here in the desert. Oh, I assure you, I'm very real, and so are the others. You never saw them before because you were so focused on your own journey. Actually, most of them never saw you either, and for the same reason. Oh, so much to take in. But let me ask you another question. How do I fix this? Son, I think you're asking the wrong question. When circumstances don't match your plans, you assume that something is wrong. When you don't hear an explanation from God about it, you assume that God has left you. There is not necessarily something to fix. I'm sorry, but I want to hear from God, and he's not talking. Again, young man, I think you ask the wrong thing. It's not about resolving everything. It's not about where you are. In fact, it's not about you at all. It's about us. Oh, okay, now I'm really confused. Let me tell you God's secret ambition, his magnificent obsession, the mystery planned since the beginning, God's sacred passion, the reason for it all. Creation, salvation, sanctification, provision. Jesus was in the garden, God upon the cross. He just couldn't get her off his mind. He loves her to death. Uh, who is she? 
She is his bride, the church, the body of Christ, ecclesia. Why have I never been taught this? You came to Christ as an individual, as all of us must. But when you came to Christ, you didn't really notice that you became part of a people, a nation, a priesthood, a body, not just a group of saved individuals. You probably sang, Jesus loves me, and assumed that was the point of the gospel. But read it again. God's goal has always been to have a people, his bride, not many brides, but one. So why are all of us together in places like this? I think you know the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing for himself a bride, and he wants her to be beautiful, radiant, without spot or blemish or any wrinkle. Now how do you suppose he will do that? I, I guess the same way that he refines each of us individually. Now you're seeing it, and I must go. He turns right and heads to the east without another word. But I'm compelled to head north, so I resist the urge to follow him. He seems so comfortable here, not at all panicked by his surroundings. I must learn. Anyway, I'm left to reflect on this new way of thinking. I'll be walking all day anyway, so... The saints in my church are the most suffering, most fragile, most dysfunctional people I've ever known. Broken, addicted, and insane. Every one. So, if it's all about us, and not just about me, what does that mean? I guess it means the ones who have already been to the desert are better able to comfort those who suffer after them. They can share how God has enabled them to overcome, to be broken but not bitter. That means my wilderness experience is not for me alone. I suffer for the whole body. Virtually every piece of wisdom, every moment of good advice, which is born from my own lessons learned during suffering, is meant for others. I had all the answers once. I readily shared them with others. Now I am more quick to cry, slower to correct, more willing to let others speak, less judgmental, far fewer answers, but more empathy, and that brings better healing than my answers ever did. Those changes have not come from the books I read, the sermons I hear, or the songs I sing. This humiliation of the wilderness at the end of my answers is what's changing me. And I realize that amazingly, the Bible says that Jesus did not complete his sufferings. His contemporary body continues to fill up what is left. One of us is ridiculed, another suffers disease, another loss. One is imprisoned and still another receives an unjust death. But it is a sign to his church to suffer as our head has suffered. When we ask why, we will always receive the same answer. Silence. The silence is part of the suffering, part of the desert. So for the sake of the body, I suffer alone because, well, I can never know why, but somehow for the whole church. A radiant bride, set apart and without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. That is God's dream, and he is willing to do whatever it takes to make his bride the wife of his dreams. Am I catching this? It is not up to me to be the bride of Christ. This is a collective journey. Jesus died for me, but more accurately, he died for us. How does this ragtag group of ragamuffins possibly become the spotless bride of Christ? I think perhaps the answer does not lie in our collective weakness, but in the collective gifts of the Spirit. Among us, we have all the major sins, addictions, foibles, and idiosyncrasies. But among us also, we have all the gifts of the Spirit. As Christ has his way among us, the Holy Spirit whittles away the human mistraits. As iron sharpens iron, he bestows grace as we minister to each other according to our gifts. Our little group has had far more than its share of tragedy and loss, death, injury, disease, unemployment, broken homes to a person we have experienced bitterness and spiritual attack from the outside. But God is in all of this, for his ultimate goal is to make for himself a radiant bride. 
the Holy Spirit paints over the canvas of our tragedies. We learn to serve one another according to our gifts. We don't serve one another so well when times are good or the sea is calm. In calm waters, we settle for socializing and entertaining one another. But when we are all sick and start leaning on each other for support, or when we together are clinging to the life raft in our collective storm, then we begin truly serving one another in love. That's our church. No one has it together. No one. But we are going through what we go through together. One person's lessons and strength help another in an area of weakness. In spite of the deep corruption in each of us, and in spite of the desert experience of each of us, we are together being shaped into a beautiful bride for Jesus. Are the weaknesses and tragedies a gift from God? That's a bit hard to say. But he certainly has a plan that sees far beyond our current trials. Me and my dysfunctional family. Gifted. Special.